Welcome to Blue Talks. Well, thank you. Wow, what an intro. Um, first of all, I just want to say it is such an honor and a privilege to be here at Oxford University speaking today. And thank all of you for, for coming out to listen today. It's fantastic. Um, so Don't Put People Forth is, is, is the title of my talk. And uh, I want to start out. Uh, my, my daughter, Tabitha Rose, is 18 years old now. And when she finds out that I use this story, she's going to be absolutely mortified. So I'm really glad we're filming today. Um, <laughs> For years, it, you know, as, as, as you heard, I, I've been in the uh, uh, corporate America for about 24 years, the last 20 or so of it in senior housing, senior living. And every day when I would leave for work, Tabitha would stop me at the door and she would look up at me with this beautiful little face and she would say, bye daddy, have a nice day, don't get on the wrong path, which is adorable, right? I mean, she stole it from Dora the Explorer, or Peppa Pig or one of those, but, but it's adorable. And so, she would do that every day, and one day I stopped her at the door, and, and I said, you know, she you know, said, bye, Daddy, have a nice day, don't get on the wrong path. And I said, Tabitha, you know, I love it when you give me such good advice every morning. She said, really, Daddy? And I said, yeah. And she said, okay, bye, Daddy, have a nice day, don't forget to wipe. <laughs> Which is also really good advice, really good advice. And so now I'm on the right path, and I'm clean, and we can thank Tabitha for that. But as I said, I've been in corporate America for about 24 years, and I've always sort of gravitated toward leadership positions. And it's not something I've sought out, it's just kind of where I've ended up. It's the things that I enjoy. I enjoy working with people as a leader, I enjoy innovating, I enjoy taking things forward and helping people be the best that they can be. But there's been a sort of a disturbing trend over the years that I've noticed, and that's that there's a very big divide and a very big gap between the frontline working teams and the management levels and the leadership levels. There always seems to be this really big division and because of that, you see companies that just churn through their people with turnover after turnover after turnover. In fact, I hear the word human capital used and it's one of my least favorite terms because humans are not capital. Humans are humans, people are people, right? And the interesting thing is so many of these companies espouse to, to really value their teams and really value their team members and they put it in their core values, right? The core values are, you know, the lessons that we all live by, the, the rules that we all live by and work by in a company, in a corporation. Um, and it was, it was nowhere more obvious than one company I worked in, I won't say the name of the company because they are still in business, but under different leadership and I understand they're a much better team now than they used to be. But this company, when I joined them, they were going through a little bit of a rebrand and a little bit of a restructure. And so they were redefining themselves and figuring out who they were, and they rewrote their core values. Now, most companies, when they do their core values, are going to go to the field and they're going to say, hey, who are we? What do we believe in? How should we, how should we uh, uh, work you know, within our, our rules? What should our rules be? How should we live? Uh, and then the field will give them their feedback and they'll go and they'll put together their core value statement and they'll list them all out. Well, this company had some tremendous egos at the top. And so what they did was they gathered all of their brilliant C-suite team members, all of their brilliant executives, and they stuck them in a room for three whole hours. And over the course of three hours, they hammered out these core values that were going to be the way that this company would operate and the values with which they would operate. And they came out with these core values, and they were very proud of them. And so they had a video conference with the entire company. And this was before Zoom, mind you. So a video conference with the entire company was a little bit of a machination to get it to work. But we managed to put it all together. We had this big video conference. And the CEO comes out with these core values. And he looked like Moses coming down from Mount Sinai with tablets to tell us how the world was going to be. And the core values, I can still remember some of them to this day. But these were the core values as best as I, as I can remember. The first core value, and usually your core values are in sort of descending order of importance, right? So what's most vital to what's least vital. And the first core value for this company was, we mind the business. It's not earth shattering, is it? In fact, I don't even know exactly what that means, but that was core value number one. Core value number two was something inane and completely forgettable. No idea what it was at this point. Core value number three was blah, 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 can't remember. But core value number four sticks to me to this very day. The fourth core value in order of descending importance for this company was we put people first. Fourth. 
right? And part of my job as a regional director with this company was to go from community to community and find out how well these core values were being incorporated and remembered and how people were learning them. And so I would go and I would say, hey, what are our core values? And almost to a man, I would get this response. Oh, uh, mind your own business and we put people forth. <laughs> And that's not exactly what they were going for, right? But it is really sort of the way the, community, the company operated. So needless to say, I didn't stay long with this corporation. I went to another uh, uh, better, better venture from there. But I started looking for leaders. And I started looking for great leaders. I started looking for those people that inspire teams and grew teams that, that really made a difference and really made a lot of impact. And in senior living, it's interesting because you can walk into a senior living community and you can usually tell within about 30 seconds whether this is a vibrant, wonderful place or whether it's a storage facility for old people, right? Because sometimes it really does feel like that. I walked into one community in Boca Raton, Florida, and the leader there, her name was Junie, and she was a fabulous leader and a fabulous person. I knew as soon as I walked in that something was different at this community because I walked in and there were smiles and there was engagement and there was laughter and there were people helping other people and it just felt good. And so I got to know Junie a little bit over the day and I, I sat with her quite a bit and Junie was a very straight-laced professional woman so she, she very, comported herself very well, she looked fabulous, she was really well put together and she ran a great business. And as I watched her during the day her people would come in and out of her office, they would bring her coffee without her asking for it. She would, she would, they would come in and they would tell her about a problem that they had solved, not one that they needed help with, but a problem they had solved and they were just informing her of what had happened. And it was fabulous, but I couldn't put my finger on what the difference was. And then about four o'clock, Junie comes, she goes, oh my gosh, it's Thursday, I need to do my chart cart. And I said, chart cart, what is a chart cart? And she said, oh, let me show you. So she goes to a closet and she opens it up and she pulls out this cart and this cart is overflowing with treats. It's got candy bars and chips and cookies and sodas and all the different things that people could want. And then this very straight laced businesswoman pulls out this Krispy Kreme donut hat, a little paper hat that she's written chart on the side, C-H-A-R-T, that was the acronym for this company's core values. And she places it on her head and she starts to go out through the community pushing this trolley. And as she's pushing it around, she stops by different groups of associates, different you know, people, that, her employees that she works with, and she gives them a treat off the cart and she has a little conversation with them. But here's the thing. As I watched her, I realized she wasn't just giving them a treat off the cart. She was giving them their favorite treats because Debbie liked Twizzlers, right? And Janice drank Yoohoo, and Bob liked Funyuns. And she knew what they liked. And the conversations she was having weren't, hey, how are you doing today? They were conversations like, Hey, Hillary, how did Jane do on this, in the swim meet this weekend? Or, hey, Bob, how's your mom doing? I know she's been sick. She knew her people. And that was astounding to me. Not only did she know her people, she knew what was going on in their lives. And that was a beautiful thing. And because she knew them, she understood how to work with them, and she understood how to get them to perform, right? And as I, you know, I watched this, this all unfold, and then we came back to her office, and I sat down with her, and I said, Junie, let me, let me ask you something. I said, that's something I've never seen a leader do before. Tell me what made, you, what made you do that? What made you decide that that's the way to approach things? And she said, you know, Dave, she says, I learned a long time ago that everybody who walks into my community, whether they be a dishwasher, whether they be a CEO, whether they be myself or, or a family member or a resident, she says, it doesn't matter who they are, every single person has equal intrinsic value in the eyes of the Lord, right? And that was, you know, it's, it's a simple statement, but it's profound, right? And, and I realized that, and so everybody that's on this earth, we're all kind of on the, on the same path. We're all playing the same game, and each one of us has fears, each one of us has desires, each one of us has anxieties, each one of us has worries and aspirations. They may be different, and we may be, we may be in different, different roles and performing different functions, but we all have equal intrinsic value. And that was the second thing that she did. She identified as human herself. So she recognized that not only were her people human, but she was human as well, and she was in the same boat as them. And because she was on that same level, she wasn't putting herself up on a pedestal, she wasn't giving herself airs, she was the leader, but she was part of that team. And that's what her team told me when I started asking them about it. And they said, they said the thing about Junie that you have to understand is that she's one of us, right? Even though she didn't start off in a, in a, a low level position in that community, she came in as a leader, but she worked with those folks. 
She was part of her own team. And that's what made her so super and so fantastic what she did. She would actually schedule herself one shift every week in, in a different department. So every week she was working in a different department. Sometimes it was you know, the care staff on the overnight. Sometimes she would go in and she would work with the, the, the cleaning crew. Sometimes she would go in and she would work in the kitchen washing dishes. It didn't matter, but one shift every week she would do the positions that her people were doing. And they knew she was gonna pitch in. And guess what? When Hurricane Wilma bore down on South Florida, her entire community turned out. Everybody was there pitching a hand, lending a hand, pitching in. Nobody evacuated, nobody ran away. They all were there for her and for that community because she had built this wonderful team. And that was a tremendous lesson to me, to see this person who, who was able to take this team that she had walked into. Again, she didn't know these people from Adam when she first got there, but she learned them and she knew them and she became part of them and she became one of them. And that was astounding to me that she was able to build that sort of leadership bond with them. And it was a great lesson for me. Another lesson I learned as I was going through my, my journey and I was looking for these great leaders, I had a community that was, again, another senior living community, but it was in, in rural Virginia, central Virginia. And, and you have to understand that central Virginia is, is not the most affluent place in the world. Let's just put it that way. It's not the most affluent place in the world. It's a very humble place. And because it's so humble, you would expect that it was, it was gonna have sort of a lower class community or a lower class vibe. But this community in Central Virginia had the best food that I've ever experienced. And not just in a senior living community, I'm talking about the best food that I've ever experienced. It was Michelin quality dining at this community in Central Virginia. And it was, such, it was to the point where everybody in our company wanted to go there to eat. When we had investors that we wanted to impress, we would take them to this community to dine at this community because the service was wonderful, the food was wonderful, and it was just an exemplary experience. I mean, who here, if you had your choice, would go to eat at an assisted living community? That wouldn't, wouldn't be your first choice, would it? But this place was phenomenal. And so as the, the VP of sales or marketing, I went to this community because I said, I need to find out what this secret sauce is. What are they doing that's different that's making it so fabulous all the time? And I sat down with Jerry Lynn, who was their dining service director, and I said, Jerry Lynn, I said, I've got to ask you, what do you do? What makes your food so wonderful? What makes your dining experience so wonderful here? Why is it like this? Well, it's not like that everywhere else. I said, you don't have the highest food costs in the company. You have some of the lowest. You don't have the highest labor costs. Again, you're, you're mid-tier. You're, you're, you're right in there. So what is it that's different? And she said, Dave, I'm so glad you asked. Have a seat. <laughs> and so I did. And I sat down with Jerry Lynn. And she said, Dave, it dawned on me one day that we want everybody to die here. And I said, no, we, we don't. As the person who's responsible for making sure that all of our communities are full of residents, I can tell you we don't want everyone to die here. She goes, no, hear me out, Dave. She said, listen, when a resident passes away at our community, it means they lived here for the rest of their lives. They never fired us. They were satisfied from the day they got here till the day that they left. And she said, that's a compliment to us. And while we don't celebrate the passing of a resident, we do need to recognize it as a compliment. And I said, you know, that's great. I'd actually never thought about, that, thought about it that way. And that's a really great way to look at it. And she said, well, because I realize that we want everybody to die here, I teach everybody who works in my shop and everybody who works in my, in my kitchen, everybody who works in my dining room, everyone who touches the resident experience under my leadership, I teach them to make every meal good enough to be somebody's last because eventually it will be, right? And I was the same way, I, oh, I mean, that was, that, that hit me hard. And I thought about that and I'm like, that is really, again, a really simple thing, but a really profound thing and a profound way to look at it. And it changed my life because I thought about it and I said, if we can do that with, with dining, why can't we do it with everything else, right? Why can't we do that with, with everything that's in us? Why can't our purpose be to make every experience great enough to be somebody's last, whether it be a touch on the arm, whether it be a conversation, accomplishment, you know, a compliment, whether it be just about anything. Why can't we make every experience good enough to be somebody's last? And I drove home from this little town in central Virginia thinking this is gonna change my life. And it absolutely has because I focus on that now every single day with my family. So we pursue our purpose with passion. And this is what she had done. She found her purpose. It was to, to make every, every meal good in his life. And she pursued the passion and she introduced her team to it. She got her team to buy in to this premise that every meal needs to be good enough to be somebody's last because eventually it's going to be. 
and she left no room for regrets. And I think that's the key when you're leading and when you're working with people and when you're, when you're following a purpose. You have to make sure that you're following it to a degree that you're never going to walk away from there and say, man, I wish I'd done more. Man, I wish I'd done better. Right? Make every experience good enough to be somebody's last. Because eventually, here's the thing, guys. None of us are promised tomorrow. Hell, we're not promised 10 minutes from now. Right? So when you do something, when you smile at somebody, when you make a difference in someone's life, make it good enough to be their last. We hope it won't be, but someday it might be. So let's make sure it's good enough. And this was sort of the key to what I uncovered to be the, the, the key to be an empathic leader, a true empathic leader who understands empathy, grace, and passion and purpose, right? You start off by putting your people first. You've got to talk about it. You have to promise to put your people first, and then you have to do it. Don't put them forth, put them first. If you're going to lead off in your core values about your people, lead off with the core values, right? Don't start it and, and then bring them in somewhere towards the end. Put your people first and commit to it, right? Lead with empathy. Know the people that you work with. Be part of their team. Identify as human and be one of them. And then find your purpose. Find your purpose and follow it with passion and teach your people to follow it with passion. Make every, every experience good enough to be somebody's last. And maybe just don't forget to wipe. <laughs> I think that's always a good one, right? All right. Thank you guys so much. I really appreciate you all. <laughs>